Welcome to a special bonus episode of Cinema Recall Podcast. Now let's welcome our host, the Vern and special guest, director of I Know What You Need, Julia Marchese. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cinema Recall Podcast. I am the Vern here with the Julia Marchese. That's, there you go. I'm horrible <laughs> with names. Did you do that okay? Yep, that was, you got it. Okay, all right. Uh, she's the director of an amazing film called I Know What You Need, and I'm so excited and happy to have you on the show to talk about this amazing feature. Uh, I do want to comment on your video background because I feel like I spent like whole hours just talking to you about <laughs> your video collection there. Everybody uh, everybody has a color coordinated. You? Everybody has a color coordinated VHS collection, right? Like that's totally normal. Um, I don't know. I've been collecting VHS since I was 12 or 13, I guess, but not to this extent. This was like when video stores started closing. I would go and, and buy stuff um, and give it a good home and a loving home. Well, I, I appreciate the dedication you give to physical media. How many videos would you say you have? Uh, about a thousand, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, good, is good there amount. one movie, is there a movie in your collection uh, that was like a rare find, just one that showed like the holy grail that you were saying to get. I had a really hard time finding The Legend of Billie Jean on VHS, and I wanted to be able to like find it organically in a store, and I went to, you know, hundreds of video stores, uh, and I couldn't, I never found it. Um, so a friend knew it was my holy grail, so they, they bought it for me. So it was a Christmas present. So I have it now. Uh, but the bootlegs are really the kind of the holy grail, like the Star Wars holiday special and, and, and like um, heavy metal parking lot okay. and stuff like that, where uh, it's things that like should be watched on VHS. Can you hear me okay? Gotcha. I, I, I hear you fine. Uh, it's a little bit of a delay there, but it should be okay. Um, uh, okay. Let you all know that uh, we're kind of having some uh, recording little issues here on both our sides there. So it's all good. It's all going to work out just fine. Um, <laughs> one more thing about your collection. I do want to talk about this feature. I promise you that. Uh, is there one movie in your collection that cost a lot of money or do you just find these all in stores? Yeah, I don't, I haven't bought any expensive ones. Um, they're mainly just stuff from thrift stores and estate sales and video chest stores closing down and stuff. Um, and uh, I'm actually there's a there's a documentary called Rewind This that's about VHS collecting that the collection is featured in. So I feel justified. Too cool. Uh, we're not here today to talk about your video collection, even though I'd like to have you back on to do so because that is amazing. <laughs> All right, I'm loving it so much. Thank you. Uh, we're here to talk about your your short feature. I know what you need. Um, based on the novel or based on the short story by Stephen King, which I had no idea. It was based on a short story until after I saw the end credits. I thought, like, oh, oh, Stephen King, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I'm just curious right off the bat, how were you able to get the rights for a Stephen King adaptation? So this, uh, I Know What You Need, was part of Stephen King's Dollar Baby program, which ran from the late, uh, from the 70s or the early 80s to last December 2023 where it was a program where you could buy the rights to certain short stories for a dollar for a year. And I bought, I uh, got the rights to, I know what you need. So uh, it was amazing to be able to film my favorite short story of his. And I've been a, a big fan of his since I was uh, a kid. And we got to shoot at the University of Maine where the story is set as well. So it's in the locations he mentions in the story, we shot in his dorm. It's uh, really, really specific. Cool. Uh the cast of I Know What You Need include, and I'm just pulling this up right now, uh, Caroline Renee, William Champion, and Giovanni Drum. And for what I gather Giovanna here, I don't Drummond. want to do any spoilers yeah. too much here, <laughs> uh, is about a young woman who meets a young boy, and the young boy is very smitten with her, and he knows things about her. Uh, things that uh, she didn't really tell anyone and the two start up a friendship which you know starts to uh, gather up more things and they start to get to know each other and there's a love story that brews in this uh, but there's something very uh, different about this guy and her roommate 
played by Gina Van Drum. She knows things about him, and uh, the girl, uh, played by Kellen or Renee, doesn't quite understand or see it, though. Uh, I like this movie very much because, from a story perspective, I had no idea exactly what was going on until much later on. I really thought this was like a simple love story. And <laughs> the twist that mates was very good. And this movie is set in 1976. And when the movie begins, it's got the whole ABC after school special. And I don't know how you and the cinematographer got to have this movie look so authentic of the 70s. With like the colors, the clothing. Uh, your set designer is amazing. I mean, the exact details they put in this background mm -hmm. are just astonishing. There's nothing about modern technology that is in this movie. It's like you legitimately put a camera back in the 70s and made it look this way. Did you shoot this film digitally or was this on film? Thank you. Thank you for saying that. That's exactly what I was hoping people would say. I wanted it to seem like a movie from the 70s and not modern at all. So I really appreciate that. It was shot on digital. It was shot on an Ari Mini. But Panavision uh, gave us a, a giant camera package of 70s lenses, which is why it looks so beautiful. And then we also did a lot of post-production uh, filters and overlays to make it look as much like film as possible. I can even see, too, that when I watched the film, it had just little bit of like bleeps and little cigarette burns like it was actually like on a film mm -hmm. but it was more than that it was like film that was transferred to video to be shown on like tv i mean this is the type of tv that i remember watching back in the day and just the way that the filters were i was just totally blown away by that so just by the look of it i was like holy shit because this is very different from other shorts that I get, you know, links and access to. And mm -hmm. most of the time, it's not shot all that well. Or they want to make something look like it's in the past, but they use a lot of, like, handheld cameras. And I love the fact very much that you made all the shots, like, like still shots. Uh, there's nothing about modern filmmaking that is in this one. You basically took the rules that were made of, like, cameras being big and heavy and clunky, you can't really do a lot of like handheld like dolly shots. So especially, uh, were you trying to be more like going through like a TV production of this or like a film production of this? Because that feels like it's like a TV version or TV so movie made the, for TV. The idea, so the idea was an after school special meets Brian De Palma was kind of what I was going for. So, you know, I'm never going to meet, meet, meet Brian De Palma levels. I understand that, but I can aim for the kind of, um, you know, craziness and, and colors and split screen that we get in the movie uh, eventually. But yeah, I just wanted it to, to really seem like an after school special because this story in particular, you know, you have a female lead, you have it taking place on a college campus, you have it be about teenage love. And it's also a cautionary tale, which is what after school specials are. So it's, you know, it kind of fit all of the of the boxes, because when I first got the rights and I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? And I, I knew I wanted to set it in the 70s, partially for aesthetic reasons, but partially because if the Internet exists, this story falls apart. Because if you can just Google somebody and find out everything about them, then it doesn't work. So you kind of have to set it in the past, which was, I think, fine with me. And I like very much the uh, cautionary aspect of the movie, uh, because when you first see these two characters get together, uh, you know, our uh, lead guy here, and uh, Ed Edward Jackson Hammond, the junior, uh, he seems like a very nice, very shy, awkward person. I mean, uh, even when I uh, look up um, the uh, Elizabeth Rogan, which first sees them, she notices, well, hey, you got you have different color socks and he's awkward and a little bit nerdy. And I kind of see myself a lot in that character of like talking to people that you're kind of nervous about talking about and mm -hmm. him showing with ice cream cones. He seems like a very genuine, nice guy. But as a case with a lot of like thrillers, you know, uh, the nice guys don't always seem to be the most nicest. But 
the weird thing too, or not really a weird thing, but what I appreciate about this movie is that even though uh, you have a potential villain in that character, you do put a lot of like warmth and humanity into him so you can understand where he's coming from. You don't look at that character as just being the bad guy because that would just be, you know, typical and lazy. And I like the fact very much that you don't do that. Uh, he has a lot Thank of like, different layers to him. And uh, I, I mean, William Champion too, the, uh, did, a, did a, a really good job with the character. And I feel like, you know, that, and that was something that, you know, if, if Edward's, Edward's creepy from the beginning because he says he's been watching her. So already, you know, there's like, eh, something's there. But if he's just straight creepy for the whole movie, it, it doesn't, it won't work. It can't sustain. So, and when I first read the story, the reason I fell in love with it is because you did have this character where I was like, oh, I feel like I would fall for this character. And I'd be like, oh, he shows up and he, you know, he's dressed in this jacket. He's got mismatched socks. He's bringing ice cream. And so, you know, I kind of went along with Elizabeth to be like, okay, something's wrong with him, but what's, you know, how bad can it be? And then, you know, it turns out to be terrible. And like, in some ways it's because it is a Stephen King project, like, you know, things will go bad. Like if it wasn't, you know, I, I, hopefully you would be fooled into thinking that everything might turn out okay. And then you're like, no, it's not going to turn out okay. Stephen King story. <laughs> and, you know, that's really about the movie too, is that uh, you, th in most stories, you're right, you, they would have painted him as being the bad guy. Now, when I watched this movie, I kind of thought her boyfriend was the bad person because mm. the way you shot it, it seemed like they did not have much communication going on. And of course, I'm referring to the character of uh, Tony, played by Colin Finn, because the way I saw you shot the scenes with them together, uh, they did not have much communication. It seemed like they got together early on in their high school years because, you know, he was popular and she was popular and they got together just based on mutual attraction with each other, but they never seemed to have much connection. And with her and uh, Edward's character, it seemed like they had a little bit more of a connection going on, like, mentally. At least the first part of the movie. So I'm thinking, all right, well, this Tony guy is going to be there to kind of, like, break them apart. And then something happens to him, which draws our characters to become closer together. And just things go on from there. Um, let's talk really briefly, though, about the cast. Carolina Renee is incredible. Her scene at the end with uh, Edward just gave me goosebumps. I was like, wow, this is just powerful, <laughs> powerful action right there. And from, from both sides, I'm not trying to dismiss, um, you know, uh, Williams Champion's role as well. He's really good. Uh, Giovanna uh, Drum is also very good. Or Drummond, sorry, Giovanna Drummond, very good mm -hmm. as well as the roommate. Um, I also would give shouts to uh, the... Um, Oh, uh, what I have here, uh, I forgot his name already, as the play of the role of Will. Sorry, uh, oh, sorry, Tony, Colin Finn. I thought he was very good in this too. Uh, how did you discover this cast? Did they audition for you? How did this happen? So uh, Caroline was the only one that I cast through Actors Access. So that's just, you know, I, I, I put up a, a breakdown and she was one of the people who replied. Uh, for the other cast members, I didn't get enough uh, because I I live in Los Angeles, but I was casting to film in Maine, so I had to cast people who were on the East Coast. So I basically what I did is I just emailed every university on the East Coast and asked if they would forward the breakdown to their drama department. And a lot of places said yes. Harvard said yes. Columbia said yes. Uh, Giovanna is from Yale. That's where they I got exported there. And Will and Colin were both from Syracuse. So it was just a matter of thank you to all of the universities that said yes of forwarding the breakdown. And that's how I found them. And I, I was so lucky because I had not met, there was 22 people all told cast and crew staying on um, campus during the week that we filmed at, in the dorms and no, almost nobody had met before. So I was, you know, I was very lucky to have a cast and crew that all meshed well together, that everybody was really pulling to be uh, as professional and really uh, get 
the film done in the way that I was hoping to. And I'm, I'm so happy everybody really, and you mentioned the cinematography, you mentioned the production design, you know, my brother, Peter Marchesi did the music. I think that has such weight in this movie and really does a lot of the hard work. So um, I'm very, very lucky to get uh, to have worked with everybody I got to on the film. That is so cool. Uh, yeah. Um, talk about shooting right there. How long did it take you to shoot this production? We were uh, we shot for six days. Really? It a, yeah, it was a very packed six days. It was a uh, we did we tried to get everything in there as much as we could, and and you know forty five minutes is a, is a long short, um, but the 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 contract with Stephen King limits your time. It's t it's forty five minutes or under. So I wanted to use all the time that I was allotted because I knew this was probably going to be the only time I would get to adapt the story. So I wanted to make it the most faithful and the biggest adaptation that could and try to keep it as faithful as possible to the story. Um, and then part of the contract as well is that you have to send a copy to Stephen King to watch so you know that going in, he'll see your end product. So I wanted to make something that I felt proud of and I felt would, that he would like. Did, he get, did, he, did you get a response back from him? Um, I have not, but uh, so uh, another part of the contract is that it's nonprofit, non-broadcast. So these dollar babies, he lets you use his name because he knows it will help with uh, film festivals because, because Stephen King's obviously, you know, going to help you, your film get eyes on it, but he doesn't want you to make money off of it. So it's something where, you know, you're not going to be able to make a feature and sell it and distribute it and stuff. Uh, so there's a... A streaming service called Arrow Player that's with um, Arrow Video, and they wanted to sh put "I knew what you need" on there. And I said, "I, you know, I think it's against the contract, but you're welcome to ask." And they did ask, and Stephen King said yes. So, I would assume that he has seen it and likes it well enough to be, you know, added to a streaming service. That's uh, a personal exception going against contract for. So, very delighted by that. I feel like that's that's the the thumbs up I need from from him. Well, I absolutely love this film. And I hope we just we got more things here. Uh, I have noticed here that you have been on a few awards, uh, the Chicago International House uh, House Awards, uh, in the Short Fest where you won Awards of Excellence. Congratulations on that! Uh, best thriller short, uh, best adapted screenplay, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, best production design for Jennifer uh, McComer, um, and then outstanding achievement in directing, best director. Uh, Julia Marchese, that is excellent. Um, question for you. Yes. When adapting a book from Stephen King, is there anything that you had to change around with like the story or things you had to cut out to adapt this into a 45 minute feature or was everything just the way it was? I tried to keep it as faithful as possible. I kept a lot of the dialogue word for word from the story but in the story there are some times where like you can jump forward but there i can't do that in film there has to be a point where we see the transition so like when uh like uh when they're, when she's leaving to go back to uh to booth bay to meet up with tony like there's not that scene doesn't exist they just do it and because they've been able to say it throughout the story and so there's like little things transition scenes and stuff that i had to write and i was really nervous that people would be like oh he didn't write that bit you know like it would stick out um because i don't you know i don't <laughs> i don't feel comfortable saying that but you know but, but when you get the contract there really there's no um restrictions on the script itself so i could hypothetically take a part of the story i like and spin off and do something else with it and it's fine there's no restrictions at all but i didn't want to do that so i really wanted to keep it um and you know if if it was a feature i feel like it, it's it's quite easy to do um you know you just kind of need to fill in some flashbacks and and stuff and and that's pretty much it um and the only thing that i cut out was there is a scene that i had between tony and um Elizabeth, that was a dialogue scene, and everybody I gave the script to told me to cut it out. I'm like, you don't need it. Like, just show them together and show that they're not talking to each other and it's they're not meant to be together. And it's you know you can do that without the scene. And I said, okay. I thought it was great when you show the sequences of them without any dialogue uh, with with her and Tony. Uh, same thing with uh, Aaron as well as uh, same thing with uh, Elizabeth. And uh, Edward, when you had scenes of them being together, you didn't really, you didn't need a lot of dialogue. You just had that store, which you said is your brother. Amazing mm -hmm. job. That store was great. Uh, when watching it, I definitely had vibes of watching like the version Suicides 
as awesome. well as watching The Love Witch, which are awesome. two movies Those that are... I, I love very much because the style is just so cool. Yeah, well, thank yeah, you. I mean, I, that's those are those are good, amazing comparisons. My brother is uh, an amazing, talented musician and has been in bands uh, and done music all of his life. And he was nervous when I asked him to do this project because he doesn't make music that sounds like an after school special. Like he's never made music like that at all. So I have to try to push him in that direction, which is you know he, it's scary for him, but I think also fun. And I think he he did such an incredible job of making it sound like a seventies score and he played everything oh. all those instruments um, are him <laughs> so that was all him oh yeah, damn all him that that is amazing when you're doing an independent feature like this because you said you shot this in six days uh i am curious here what do you do as a director to get your crew and your actors i guess motivated for the scene or do you just show just do you just show up and say here's the script we're going to shoot the scene. Um, do you give <laughs> any like homework to your cast members or crew oh, yeah. uh, before each scene is shot? Um, well, we, you know, I was in pre-production. So I was, I, I originally got the contract in 2019 and I got the contract pushed a year because of the pandemic. And so I had uh, more than normal long time to do pre-production, but like hardcore pre-production is about six months. And that was time where I was showing like I showed my cinematographer Bam of the Paradise. And I was like, okay, this is a Brian De Palma movie. I love these are the things that I love about it. And like these are the things that I'm going for. We watched some after school specials together. I gave assignments for movies to watch to the actors. I'm like these are the characters that I feel like the character that your character is similar to or like the vibe that I'm going for. And then on set, you know, the first day of the day before we started shooting, I brought all the cast and crew together and we had a meeting and I said, you know, this is a collaborative art film is uh, the film crew and the cast everybody has opinions on this set and I want to hear everybody's opinion and you know if you're a cinematographer or gaffer you know you know more about those things than I do because that's your job that's a specialty and if you have an idea of something that you think that might be a better fit for the scene let me know and it, maybe we'll do it and maybe we won't maybe we'll try both ways you know and I tried to make sure that everybody felt comfortable letting you know their opinions be heard because it's everybody's movie not just mine exactly who is your cinematographer by the way uh that is alex simon he also did the cinematography from my first film out of print which is a documentary he is super awesome that's very cool. yeah I, I gotta say uh you mentioned about brian de palma which yeah. i definitely see the similar similarities because of the split screen but i also saw a lot of mario bava and okay. argento oh. In your films for the use of colors. <laughs> yeah, the I wanted to uh, to to go crazy in the in the end sequence, and so you know that's a kind of giallo, too bright, kind of fake reality, um, and because all, all the rest of it has looked, you know, all of it's so dreamlike. And I uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. There's a sequence where things get to be really intense with use of colors, and then it switches back to like normal mode right there which i thought was absolutely brilliant the way that was like edited or the way the camera's like Shh. i can't believe that you just shot this in six days this is just blowing my <laughs> mind here that well i should also like think a so. very complicated <laughs> stuff to do so you uh, kudos to your crew as everything i can say that was just an amazing job thank you um, yeah I'm when we like, worked we worked hard we had storyboards and um you know to to make sure we got everything in that we needed to get in and uh, shout out to my editor rick dominicus uh, who really did a fantastic job with the editing and uh, making it look the way it looks with the color correction as well and my sound designer john shell who also did such a good job of layering um the sounds in and and really making it uh you know, because even even in, you know, I I just we, we played it. Um, I played at San Diego Comic-Con this summer and it was playing in this wonderful big room with like a nice big echo. And you could really hear all of the little things that he had put in. So like when they're in the classroom, you can hear people out in the building, in the big hallway behind them. And like when they're in the dorm packing, you can hear people on other levels, you know, packing. So you feel like there's lots of people around them, even though there's only four people in the whole film. Oh, that's that is amazing. That's really cool. Uh, I'm going to jump back to your cast. We talked about mm -hmm. your crew there because uh, we did talk about uh, Carolina, Carolina Renee. Uh, but I do want to talk about the other cast in this too. Uh, William Champion as, as Edward. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Where did you discover him? 
So he was part of the university casting call. He was, um, and Edward is a hard part to cast because you have to start off as this, you know, very shy nerd who goes into a romantic lead, who goes into like psychotic monster. And so you have to find somebody who can do all of that. And I feel like he really was able to embody the character. He's also a big Stephen King fan. So he was really excited to play the character. And then uh, Giovanna Drummond, who plays Alice, I think is you know, also so fantastic. And she's from Yale. And she, uh, because her big monologue that she gives in the bed, uh, bedroom at the end, she's a theater actor. So like she just did that whole thing, you know, the, from, and I would just shoot it from different angles. So it's not like you're doing a couple sentences we're cutting. It's like you're doing that whole thing, you know, which is very extensive uh, over and over and over again. And she did such a killer job. She's probably like the unsung like hero of this movie, Giovanna Drummond. She's like that secret weapon, that little mm -hmm. ingredient that made this movie good. Like, you have like this uh, cake, and William Champion and Kalana Renee are like the big portions of this cake that are like really good. And then Giovanna Drummond is like that special ingredient that just makes the cake just that much better. And I love her very much in this feature. And I hope every person in this cast. Even Colin Finn, who has no dialogue in this movie, I hope they all go on to get more roles because they are just incredibly great. I was literally blown away by just how good and like they just brought their all. Uh, when um, Renee is having her, you know, big argument. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. When Elizabeth is having her big argument with uh, Edward, uh, just the tension that they bring is just. I was just totally impressed by it. I was never seen a short where I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, damn. They're giving this all. And you mentioned their theater <laughs> actors too. And then, yeah, it makes total sense. Uh, I will say this, Julia, if you ever make another short and you need someone to like walk by a street, I will mm -hmm. do that. There is a scene where um, I believe uh, Elizabeth is coming back to find out where Edward is. And there's characters warming their hands by the fireplace and just mm -hmm. see their hands i would be i would love to be one of those hands just to be <laughs> okay. in this uh i was absolutely i would just hold a boom mic just to like <laughs> be there for a day just to be involved with that because i was absolutely impressed by this um you mentioned that this is playing on arrow player is that correct yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, and then it's also uh, going to be playing at the first annual Stephen King convention, King Con, in Las Vegas, on October in o the end of October. This October. End of October. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll make sure to post links on our site for the King Con, correct, as mm -hmm. well as Arrow Player, cool. for people to watch this feature. Um, yeah. And if, I, if people I, don't have either of those uh, things, they can always uh, message me as well if you'd like to see it. So I uh, would be happy to show it. I almost wish that Keen would allow this to, to have a physical media release, like a Blu-ray, because I would love a cast and director commentary <laughs> on this. That would be really cool. Yeah. I do have a VHS version. My, uh, my sound designer, John Shell, made a, a special custom version just for me that has the case with our stuff on it he uh, has the tape has uh, previews for other after school specials it's really it's really great it's so it was really kind of gift that is amazing don't tell people that because people are trying to contact you like i want that vhs tape how much you want for that <laughs> i will totally buy every i want to buy that so much oh but i i, I don't know what's more to say about this uh cinematography is great the set design. You made this in six days? God damn, that's amazing. <laughs> I, uh, there are movies that take years to make that don't look as good as this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that has like a lot of work there to do. I mean, uh, six days, like full, like, do you, do you go from like the sun rising to the sun sets or like how many hours did, did you shoot each day? Uh, it depends. Some days, yeah, some days it's like 12 hours, 16 hours, but you know, you only have a week to do it, so you're going to do as much as we can and then try to get prepped for the next day damn damn that's uh, impressive stuff there julia i when you sent me the link for this i was like oh okay so nate in 70s yeah that like brian De Palma aspect and i was like right when it started i was like oh okay and then just went on and the storyline really sucked me in 
because you are kind of with uh, Elizabeth and being this new guy and this new guy, you know, he may have some awkward things about him, but he seemed to be genuine nice and really cares about this girl. And I could see myself as being that person. And then he got to be a little bit obsessive about her. And I was like, oh, and then I found myself um, sort of like um, how we call here, uh, sympath sympathizing with Alice, her roommate, and thinking that, mm -hmm. oh, all right, well, Alice is now the secret kind of like hero to the story. Uh, but yeah, I love this feature because you can totally understand why Elizabeth does fall for Edward in the in the role of the story, and just amazing. I love all the twists and turns and mates with it. Uh, the pacing is just right on. There's never a moment that feels like it's sort of like wasted, but yeah, I thank you, love this and I, I, I thank you so much. I cannot wait for more people to check this out. Uh, yeah. You will find my full written review of this movie when this show posts. All right, so you'll be able to find this episode over on our YouTube page as well as our podcast links cinemarecall.net or just type in Cinema Recall. Um, Julia, where can people find you if they want to contact you to see this feature or just to view anything you have? Uh, I am on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok as Julia C. Marchesi. And then I also have three podcasts. I have a podcast called Horror Movie Survival Guide, which is teaching you how to survive horror movies. Uh, I have the Losers Club, all about Stephen King, and then also Jodorowsky, all about Alejandro Jodorowsky and his art. So you can listen to me yap on about a number of things. Um, and then, you know, uh, I also have another film out of print, which is available to stream on Amazon Prime and Canopy, uh, which is a documentary about the importance of revival cinema and 35 millimeter. And I'm always doing all sorts of crazy stuff around film. So you can always find me online. You know, I think I've seen that feature out of print, but it's been many years. I did not know you directed that. I did, I will yeah. have to go revisit that again. Yeah, I used to work at the New Beverly I... Cinema for eight years. And so I used to do programming there and uh, their guest series. And uh, this, you know, and, and if you look, I think if you watch these two back to back, you can see the, the grooviness link that is between them both. Oh. All right, before we go, because you did adapt a Stephen King novel. Uh, mm -hmm. Last night, I did watch three Stephen King adaptations. I okay. rewatched Misery, yep. The Mist, yep. and Carrie. Okay. In your mind, in your opinion, what is the best Stephen King adaptation? Not counting your own. Can't do sure. that. And what is like the worst Stephen King adaptation, that would, in your would, opinion? That would be so weird to pick my own. The best one and the worst one? Um, the, yes. so, I mean, Carrie's hard to beat because of, you know, De Palma and it being the first one and it helped like rocket ship Stephen King to start him. I think, uh, Pet Cemetery was the, was the movie that got me into Stephen King and horror simultaneously. So that one has a really special place in my heart. I think that the chapter one of the 2017 it is pretty much perfect. I think it's uh, really beautiful. Um, as far as the worst ones, um, yeah, Dreamcatcher is not very good. But Dreamcatcher is not a very good book either. So it kind of is like, all right, they kind of suit each other. Kind of suit each other. Um, so I would say that's, that would be it. <laughs> have, I mean, okay. have, have you seen Dreamcatcher? I have. And I have not read the book, so I can't make the comparison. But I was really a big fan of Dreamcatcher. Okay. It was a one and done thing. And Okay. Did you, have I'm you read this, this, this short story? I know what you need. I have not. Because like okay. I said before, I had no idea it was a Stephen King adaptation until I saw the end credits. I'm like, oh, based on the short story by Stephen Oh, okay. Well, it's Fair a enough, night shift will... and highly recommended and see if you can uh, see how it feels to compare and contrast the two. I will like, I would definitely like to do that. Uh, I still need to, there's a lot of like, adaptations that I miss. I know that like, the first Stephen King book I ever read was Christine. Mm. And then I saw John Carpenter's film. And I really liked that one. What he did with the changes for that was very cool. Uh, then I read Misery, mm -hmm. and I saw the movie like a month later with my whole entire family, which is a weird thing to watch for like a Christmas movie for the family to watch. <laughs> but we all sat down to watch Misery, and I thought that adaptation was very good. Uh, I think Joe's Game, uh, Mike Flanagan's Joe's yeah. Game, was a really good adaptation 
of that story because uh, it's just about a woman stuck in bed, handcuffed, and that's it. That's the story. And I thought Mike Flanagan did a really good job with like adapting that Agreed. material because it's difficult to adapt a material where <laughs> it's all in a person's head. And I thought that he did a good job of doing that. I even liked oh, his yeah. uh, Doctor Sleep, which... Agreed. I think Mike Flanagan does uh, Stephen King well because he's clearly a Stephen King fan and it shows. Is there a novel, okay, you did a short story of Stephen King. Is there mm-hmm. ever been like a novel you just said, oh, I want to dip my toes into that. I really want to adapt that. Is there one that you really want to do? The, that, it's a hard question because a lot of my favorite books have already been adapted into movies so good that there's no way I would want to do it again. Like I'm not going to adapt Pet Cemetery or It or The Shining like I don't need to right because they're already out there and they're perfect so it's it's hard to think of one that hasn't been done or hasn't been done well that would um there's a there's a, I'm a big fan of Richard Bachman his uh, alter ego where he kind of writ, wrote darker meaner stuff and uh nobody's done road work and I really like road work so I would give that one a whirl there's one book of Stephen King that I want to have adapted but I don't know who can do it if you can do it great it's the eyes of the dragon oh yeah it's surprising that there isn't uh an adaptation of that that would be a really cool one to do that'd be super fun and 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 fantasy based you know dark fantasy stuff i i and be the fact that a lot of like fantasy shows are out right now i think you could do a good job with it um i just don't know how that would be i don't want to become a series i want to be an actual movie in theaters that people go to Okay, let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's, you know, come on, Stephen King. I'll do it. Give me the money, and no, we'll make it happen. <laughs> oh well, Julia, it was an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. This was so cool. Thank you for saying such kind things about the film. I'm really, really glad that you liked it, and I'm glad you got to watch it in a kind of ideal way, where it, you know, looked like it was from the '70s, and you also didn't know there was going to be this big hard twist so that makes me happy yeah I completely like blown away because it, it kind of reminded me of that movie audition oh wow Type she mickey's audition <laughs> just not not as it's stream but the way the movie just becomes like this like romance and it sort of it devolves mm-hmm. into something else i was like yeah I will, I will take, I will thought, take it oh. I, I haven't heard that one that comparison before but i'm all about it so <laughs> thank you <laughs> I was like, okay, well, this could be a sweet little, like, little love story. Okay, this guy is a little twisted and weird. Okay, so there's going to be like, a triangle going on between the roommate and her and her ex-boyfriend and now the new boyfriend. All right, it's going to be kind of standard. And then, oh, oh, oh there's, like, supernatural elements to this thing here. Okay. I mean, it's Stephen right. King. There's going to be, there's gonna be something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well... Again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone out there, for watching this interview. Uh... Right now, uh, for Cinema Recall Podcast, uh, we have up on our Patreon page our audio drama adaptation of Reservoir Dogs. Uh, we did Reservoir Dogs, but with an all-female cast, and that's done and complete. So if you want to listen to our audio adaptation that's over on our Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash Pod, and that will be coming to the public at the end of October, um, sort of October, November, around there, so you will uh, you know, hear that. And then I'm also going to be posting on our YouTube page um, some video outtakes we've done of the recording with the cast, and that's a lot of fun, so you'll be able, you'll be able, ah, you'll be able to see that on our YouTube channel. Uh, but as I said, always, uh, thank you so much for listening to Cinema Recall, uh, and that's it. I'm The Vern. I'm your special guest, Julia Marchese. Uh, thank you again for coming on the show. I hope you come back on again. It can be to talk about anything to be about your podcast as well. I would love that very much. Um, sure. Yeah. Just ask. You want to talk about VHS? Right. You want to talk about podcasts? You want to talk about whatever? Want to come over and see all the VHS collection there? And I'll bring cookies <laughs> and okay. You know, all right, that's a good bribe. Whatnot. Give me some double dip ice cream cones. There we go. Oh, <laughs> well, it melted on my hands there too. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And that's it.